va. Bon, on y va. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Stefan Rudik today. Uh, that is now at the University of uh, Wisconsin. So, uh, Stefan did his uh, PhD in uh, Israel. It was uh, Technion, no? Yeah, on the south, in Bersheva. Bersheva, <laughs> on the south, okay. <laughs> And it was on the nonlinear uh, 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 mechanical behavior of balloon. I remember, okay. but he will, he will tell us. And uh, I met uh, Stefan uh, when he was working in uh, postdoc at MIT with Marie Boyce. Mm -hmm. And today we'll uh, talk uh, to us about instabilities for patterns in soft composites. So, uh, Stefan, uh, it's uh, your turn. Merci <laughs> and bonjour. And um, that's as far as my French goes. Probably will learn more. All right. So. Um, So, the, the, so there will be two parts uh, in this talk. Um, so the first uh, will be mostly focused on instabilities. And the second part is that it's just short name that is not really very adequate uh, for that that I called acoustic metamaterials. But basically, it will be uh, more about elastic waves and how it can be controlled by instabilities. So the second part will be connected to the first. And the short outline, a few examples of these patterns in elastic instabilities. And here, Um, and that's what's basically what we will talk here about. So the first uh, simple example is on the wrinkling instabilities in laminates, very, 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 very basic uh, uh, stuff. Um, then uh, so there are also in 3D uh, for fiber composites and uh, uh, that, that how they buckle, and then some more bizarre behavior in 2D and relatively new work uh, on the uh, formation of domains through instabilities in soft, soft materials. So, <clears throat> um, so, so, so well, this is a promised example for, for the, sorry, for the laminates. Uh, very simple, so we have soft matrix, stiffer, stiffer layer. I promise not to move too much, so the camera can't follow me, so <laughs> but I need to reach here. So that's the matrix is supposed to be sort of grayish, but almost the same uh, as white here, and stiffer layers. So we'll compress them, and then, uh, of course, you, you expect that they will buckle these stiffer layers, but they need to somehow decide this, how to buckle together with the matrix. Um, <clears throat> okay, and after it falls, it probably doesn't work. Okay, still does, thank you. Um, and so you load that, and of course they buckle, and so there's some uh, uh, waviness and some wavelengths that we can uh, can, uh, can can measure. Of course, uh, almost elastic, so we can restore restore the initial shape when the loading is released. And now, for even in this system, we still have some parameters that we can control: is the volume fraction or the ratio between the stiff, uh, the thickness of the soft soft face and stiff face, and also the uh, elastic moduli. So now, if I bring them closer, so the uh, thickness ratio decreases, or how, depending on how you define it, increases. And then, uh, the what you change, you change the uh, you can get the tunability of the of the wavelengths here. Uh, and of course, we also can tune the, uh, the behavior with changing the, uh, the contrast in the material properties of the young modulus for uh, a relatively large uh, stiffness, uh, stiffness ratio in terms of young modulus of more than 1,000. Then you get to the regime when you get uh, uh, what is called uh, long wave mode. So basically, I can get even larger Uh, mode here, just uh, limited here by the size of the sample that I put here. So the larger the sample will be, the uh, larger will be the, the wavelength here. All right, so, uh, they, so they are not really very perfect, these, uh, these wrinkles here, but it's just uh, related to the way how we do the experiments and uh, it's very hard to get anything that is, would, be, uh, uh, would be perfect. So there's some, some interfaces uh, in these 3D printed materials. So we use 3D printer just uh, to, to avoid some debonding at the, at the, at the boundary between the soft matrix and the stiff materials. But then we created uh, some other defects because of that and it's not very perfect. Anyway, so, <clears throat> Okay, so just to illustrate that a little bit, um, um, nothing very special. So you compress it, certain level, the uh, the the the, the stiffer layer buckle, 
uh, and develop this uh, very nice uh, wavy uh, shapes that are actually, they agree very well with uh, analytical predictions and with uh, numerical simulations. So now, so I will not really go into too much details with that, but just to outline what we do. So the first part is that we do, we use what is called uh, small on large analysis. So first finite deformations, and then the instability analysis in terms of uh, small, uh, small amplitude changes. So uh, because of periodicity and things that uh, we work with uh, uh, periodic composites, so we used it, what is typically called in literature's block, block Flaky analysis, uh, which is quite powerful, but sometimes time consuming because then you, can, you need to scan uh, all these different wavelengths, uh, wave numbers. And if it's in 2D, still it's, it's probably OK. But in 3D, it becomes uh, really uh, very uh, time consuming. Uh, but uh, then you can capture instabilities basically at any length scale, if there is anything. Uh, and the specific the special case for that would be uh, the long wave uh, type of instability, when you just can say that you can homogenize uh, the, the properties of the material, and then uh, that will be your limit. Uh, here, actually, we'll, of course, agree with the analysis for block wave. Uh, but this is, of course, uh, the long wave uh, instability, macroscopic instability analysis would be um, more effective and easy to perform once you obtain this tensor of elastic moduli. So then just the loss of elliptic condition. And so that will predict you then set of uh, sometimes referred as macroscopic or long wave uh, type of instability. So basically, this is what, what we do what behind the scene uh, and uh, different uh, material functions and potentials that we can use for different phases, different geometries, but that's basically the uh, framework for that. So now, with all this machinery, you can detect what happens. And then uh, to go to post buckling what happens after, uh, we typically just use find elements but with the help uh, of the analysis to, to help the computer to find, to find what happens. Uh, that's how it would look typically for lam laminate, just a, uh, a simple example uh, of that. So there's some uh, distribution of uh, inhomogeneous fields that uh, we create but after instabilities, of course. Uh, and the typical behavior is that you, of course, you go to a softer mode of deformation. So this is stress-strain curve. That, 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 that the, your, let's say, bifurcation point, and then if you measure the amplitude that put into finite elements, so that when it start growing after a more or less uh, that uh, strength we approach the stability. All right. So, so with this, so again, uh, talking a little bit about laminates, so you, we have these two parameters: uh, geometrical parameters, material parameters that we can control or. Uh, and some, some of them we can realize in uh, experiments. But then once you have these, so you, you, you have one sample and you want to switch it to a different configuration. So you are basically stuck at one of these points, depending what you what is the stiffness contours, what the materials that you used, and what is the geometry. So you can trigger one of these. It's just unique, uh, single one. Um, so <laughs> well, um, the, one of the motivations here is to create more tunability, create more structures out of something uh, simpler or something that we started with. And uh, so what we have done here is just uh, used the uh, essential inelastic behavior, the uh, rate sensitivity of soft materials that we can load it differently. And then as a result, we can obtain uh, potentially different structures. Um, <clears throat> right, so this is a simple example for that. So there will be the same sample that is loaded at different strain rates. So slower here, faster here, just a strain rate here measured. Um, and so they, they already loaded to a certain uh, strain. This is, I think, about 15%. Um, and so this is a slow one. And these are a little bit faster. And uh, so what is supposed to be uh, clear to see from here is that, um, that here, in this case, uh, we already have these wavy pattern uh, developed while this one still remains uh, remains uh, flat and is not uh, is not buckled yet and so <coughs> this um, just uh, in parallel as we usually do some numerical simulations to look into what happens behind this um, <coughs> and of course the uh, numerical simulations look much more perfect and there's no uh, no uh, 
defects on the serv on the on the on the interfaces, etc. But uh, with uh, material, certain material material constants and certain uh, viscoelastic models, uh, we used actually a relatively simple one. Um, we can capture this, this similar behavior. Again, no buckling here. Also, we load it exactly at the same rate, so it's basically the same material, but not the same rate. It's the same level of deformation, just a different rate. And of course, here we already have a buckling. Uh, if we continue to load this guy, of course, we'll also make him, uh, the, the, the sample buckle. That's what, what happens here at larger uh, level of deformation. All right, so, so that's with this. So, uh, we can, but basically what you can also see is that what we are able to tune with this material is just the point when it starts buckling. So we didn't really change much uh, the microstructure. The wavelengths didn't change. So it just, uh, um, that's the limitation. It came, so in theory, in numerical simulation, we can do that. It just, uh, um, well, you need a certain viscoelasticity to, to make it happen. So, but in experiments, we were limited with the materials that we could use uh, for that. So there were, uh, there, we don't have the, the materials that would also change the wavelengths upon, upon buckling. So we don't really have the right materials for that. But of course, in theory and uh, in, in, in simulations that uh, can be, can be uh, easily be done. All right, so now from 2D, explaining that a little bit more to 3D. So, and I will start from uh, transversely azeotropic composites. So, when all the fibers are uh, aligned in one direction, but they're randomly distributed in in in, in, a, in a perpendicular um, cross section. And then, uh, so uh, when we load them, very similar to laminates, you also expect them to buckle, right? So that's uh, <clears throat> and that's what uh, uh, what will happen. And so what we uh, had here is uh, the prediction of when, when it will happen. So this is a critical stretch. And it's a compact uh, expression uh, in terms of effective moduli that are given in terms of volume fractions and material properties. So that's uh, just the, the only information that we need to get the critical strain or critical stretch is that what are the properties of each phase and what is the volume fraction, how much of the most stiff or soft materials we put in here. So. <coughs> And then, uh, so we can we can predict that 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 the the onset of buckling. Uh, this is a formula for obviously for uh, for macroscopic for long wave uh, instability. So right, we use just a tensor of elastic model, the effective one, uh, for, for to derive that. So if there is something uh, microscopic instability developing, we cannot really capture uh, with this formula. And we're going to look into that. So now. I'm going to compare that to a uh, 2D case with laminates, which was actually used uh, 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 to predict, to predict uh, uh, the onset of instability, critical strain. Uh, so, so this is a critical stretch. And this curve basically just divides the stable region less than one and compress and buckles. And this is an unstable, unstable uh, domain. So this is for uh, laminates in 2D. So now um, I will. I also can, uh, of course, uh, allow these laminates to, to, to deform in 3D. Uh, there's not much of a difference. What happens, uh, the structure uh, the, of the solution is, is very similar. And now for the, uh, the solution for the fibers, also the looks like, looks like uh, uh, very, very much alike with the, with the, with the laminates. Okay? Now, this is, again, this, is, uh, this type of what I illustrate here is a long wave microscopic instabilities. And, but if we look into smaller volume fractions, that actually where it is known for, for laminates that will have this uh, wrinkling, wrinkling pattern. So, and for fibers, we also expect that, and that indeed what happens, um, but it happens at much larger strains, uh, so they're much stable, more stable, so it's the same volume fraction, the same materials that we put in. And uh, at a certain point, I got to believe that uh, we also can get some 3D, 3D uh, uh, helical structures in, 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 the, in the systems. All right, so this is basically the map of uh, when it happens, so with critical critical strain when, when, uh, when they will buckle. So now I'm going to look into the what will happen and that measures that in terms of the wavelengths or wave number. So basically, well, reporting here has a wave number. And I uh, just picked one contrast in the stiffness ratio and uh, having here um, <coughs> uh, just varying the uh, volume fraction of the fibers. 
Right, so uh, then 2D layers, and uh, I can also put again the 3D. Uh, in terms of the wavelengths for instability, you can see that they basically there are almost no difference. Maybe just at very small volume fraction you start seeing a little bit, but not really very significantly. Now with fiber composites in 3D, again, same volume fractions. So what you will see is that quite significant difference, and especially uh, well in the region uh, to, towards smaller, smaller volume fractions, when you have this microscopic instability. And basically, um, so I will pick, uh, as I usually do, uh, the one that is uh, most striking here. So it's, uh, the contrast here will be between 2 and 16. So it will be the wavelengths uh, that we obtain is, uh, is a factor of 8. So that's a quite significant difference between these two, in a way, similar system. right? So, and uh, another thing that we looked into is uh, volume for action decreases at certain fixed uh, uh, stiffness ratio, then uh, there is a, there, okay, so what we observed once is that uh, numerically is that we had this uh, helical pattern developing in the uh, 3D fiber composite. Of course, uh, in, in laminates, uh, you cannot expect something like that. So that's, uh, that's uh, probably one of the most exciting uh, things that we had that time. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, so that was a motivation to do experiments on that. Uh, so we printed this, uh, tested, so this is a typical stress strain curve for this, uh, relatively small volume fractions, uh, well, 1, 2 percent, uh, a little bit more. Uh, basically, that, that's uh, more or less in the vicinity of these peaks, that's where you detect the instability. Not exactly, but some estimation from experiment, yeah. This is for the entire system. This, this curve is for the entire system, right. it's just the metric. Uh, I don't have a way to okay uh, to to know what is the stress. I can estimate that, but this is entire system. Yes, yeah, so it's composite. The compress match the force divided by the area, and that's uh, um, <coughs> that that that. Uh, so so basically, yeah. And so that's that's more or less uh, how we detect it from experiments the critical critical strain. So. Um, <clears throat> because at this point, when there is a reduction in the in the stresses or there is some flattening, you still don't see the pattern. It just it will will emerge uh, a little bit a bit a little bit early, uh, later. So you can take these points uh, now as a function of the uh, volume fraction. Put it put it here together with numerical uh, numerical results and just this all simulation results. So that's why. This points perfectly on the curve. It's not uh, um, <clears throat> just distinguishing between what we in uh, numerical simulation uh, detect as long wave or macroscopic instabilities or uh, microscopic at smaller volume fraction. And so single single fiber case, so everything converts there, so that gives you some confidence that numerics is, is okay, uh, doesn't produce any nonsense. And uh, with experiments, more or less, so we are actually quite close to the trend. Uh, which is already a good, good, good sign. Um, <clears throat> all right, so this again, critical strain when it happens, and now looking into the wavelengths, into uh, what happens at which wavelengths the instability uh, pre uh, develop. Um, and that's basically the transition from this macroscopic prediction, long waves, and to, to microscopic, how it changes with the, with the wavelengths. Again, that single fiber case, so we need to, con we should converge there. Um, at the limit of uh, zero volume fraction of the fibers. And now for the experiment, so we have a uh, somewhat that it um, agrees with the microscopic long wave type of mode, so that looks uh, like that. And actually buckles again in 2D here, so we didn't really see uh, 3D, 3D modes here. And then when there is a transi transition to microscopic, when supposed to change to smaller wavelengths, so that's what we also see in experiments. Uh, well, the trend is here, but of course the values, if you start to co compare them, that they don't really agree very well. Uh, <clears throat> that's more or less a visualization. So the, the uh, images are not very good because they're basically, so it's not like a laminate that have the layer on the surface. I, I'm actually looking through the metric that is supposed to be transparent, but it's not really, so that's a, it's a shady, shady uh, uh, images that uh, appear here. And uh, unfortunately for us, or maybe not, it's just the nature of what happens is that we always saw 
uh, this uh, the, the pattern in, in 2D, not, in, not, not a helicon one, which probably the, what, what actually uh, would happen. Uh, maybe that uh, <clears throat> uh, we need to look more closely in what we predicted with numerical results with this uh, helical helical patterns. All right, so um, uh, that's with this. Uh, so what uh, we also looked into uh, trying to understand maybe one why or when we can what affects the helical patterns and maybe we can obtain them is that we can control the also the instability by positioning these fibers in a certain periodic manner, so uh, putting them close in one direction, further in another. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so, uh, so one of the things that I saw that basically once we give uh, more space in this direction, so it becomes softer, they will just uh, will control these, uh, uh, these uh, fibers to buckle in this direction, uh, which appeared to be not the case. Uh, it actually works in the opposite way, which wasn't uh, apparent to me entirely. Uh, so that I had to argue with the students with Jan, Jan uh, Lee about that before he did the experiments and showed that it's in, indeed the case. So I was wrong here. Um, but so that's how it looked like. Uh, so the critical wavelengths here, the aspect ratios that you measure. So this numerical predictions, uh, so you can change this sizes and you can control the wavelengths quite a lot, so the by factor up to up to five. Um, now, and uh, so that's what first numerical predictions show that they will actually, the fibers will, uh, for some reasons, they would prefer to buckle sort of corporately all together in one direction, yes? I don't understand. To compute the, the buckling threshold and the critical uh, the wave number, uh -huh. do you have to take into account the interaction in between two fibers, or you just solve the problem in the elementary? Uh, yeah, but so um, you do take the uh, into account the interaction. Otherwise, there will be no difference. Or, or I mean, so they, they, you have periodic boundary conditions. You have certain. So certain conditions that uh, you know make your fiber here or the whole system that unit cell feels that there is somebody uh, here, and uh, you need to accommodate the deformation, the buckling more together. So that's uh, that's uh, that's the restriction. And uh, so the this block 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 analysis we perform scanning uh, wavelengths in this direction. Also, we checked a few in this direction too, just make sure that. We don't miss a few patterns that uh, build a new periodicity of, say, three by two in, 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 in this plane. We didn't find anything interesting, unfortunately, there, so just, but check, 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 check that. Uh, but we didn't check, of course, the whole space because then it will take enormous amount of time it's in, in 3D. Okay? Uh, so, so, uh, basically, uh, yeah, so they, 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 they talk to each other, this unit cell. And they, co they actually coordinate the action where to buckle. And they actually decide to go there, uh, which uh, uh, wasn't really clear for me and, uh, until uh, we started looking into the elastic wave propagation of this. And then you see how the polarization modes change as you approach instabilities. And then it makes sense of what happens. And yeah. H is very large. This H is in. This is very long. Uh, th that's exactly, this is the number, uh, it's a normalized number, of course, but that's the number that you get. So it doesn't matter what H you take. Actually, it's better for you to take H as small. The thing is that with this H. Compared to D? Hmm? Com what is H compared to D? H this can be anything, but you have the wave number that matches this to, and I can scan this wave number. That is exactly the first part on block flocky analysis that allows you to do that. Yeah, you change it, you change it, and at huh? one point. Yes, yes, yes. You know, no, I don't change H. You if I don't change H, I just change K. So there is a there is a matching between these two in, in certain exponent, right? Uh, and then you just scan K, and that gives you new periodicities that can be, you know, even much larger or or of the same size, so that's uh, you just actually you, you need to make it small enough so you don't mix down there anything. So uh, alternatively, it can be done in actually physically changing H and making this strictly periodic. 
So in this direction, it's not strictly periodic. It's uh, you use this block Fouquet analysis that gives you. It's not this ISO H with okay. the size, the total size of the system. No, 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 no. It's it's the size of the unit cell that was used in that block Fouquet analysis. So just yeah. Um, <clears throat> All right, I, I, I never thought that that would be so <laughs> confusing because, yeah, if you think about it, it is confusing. <laughs> so, all right, so uh, I think that, um, so that some illustration of this wavelengths uh, as we change this aspect ratio and, uh, well, to, 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 to illustrate them, so we printed them in certain ways so we can get a bet, better picture here. Uh, and the wavelengths uh, do, does change here. And that's uh, basically the points that we uh, we have here. Uh, so yeah, again, so the trend captured very nicely. But if you try to to to, to compare the differences between between this, of course, it's apparent that uh, there are quite significant differences between experiments and uh, and the numerical prediction. But well, trend uh, uh, is really very beautifully uh, captured. Uh, so one more thing that we also uh, saw here is that there are Interestingly, appear two uh, lower and upper bounds for uh, changing when we change the aspect ratio. And basically, well, here you are bounded by the uh, the symmetrical case of the circle uh, of the uh, quadratic uh, unit cell. So when they be equal to a, but here at the upper part you actually you are bounded by the results, analytical results by the of the laminate. Which is which is interesting. It actually makes sense. So if you think about it, so when you uh, put uh, these inclusions very close together, so they start to act uh, in a way uh, as a as a, a reinforced layer. So as a, la as a laminate. Okay. So that's uh, where the video that I know doesn't work. I have it here prepared. So this is already a different system. So going in 2D, but uh, uh, that behaves uh, a little bit uh, different. So basically, what you have here. Uh, so there's uh, these are uh, voids, so there's no material in here. Uh, there's different inclusions, so it's sort of uh, supposed to be a little bit more white. And there is a, a somewhat uh, dark in between. This is a soft matrix that will deform a lot, and all the deformation will appear in that. So now we're going to compress it, and um, of course the you know, voids uh, will will collapse and uh, rearrange in some, something different um, upon upon instabilities. And right, so then, um, so in the first stage, they sort of uh, uh, create new, uh, new, new symmetries here. Then we continue push that, and these the stiff inclusions uh, destroy in a way uh, these patterns that were created at first stage. So there's sort of a sequence of, of uh, different microstructures we uh, travel from one, one to another. So. Uh, <clears throat> Of course, in this in this system with the void pores, uh, the material is uh, sort of expected to show negative Poisson ratio. We compress in one direction, it may shrink in this direction, depending how we constrain it here. The boundary they uh, may may affect that. So we will have yeah, so negative Poisson ratio behavior in this system. And this, uh, the inclusions uh, they have a, a quite uh, uh, interesting uh, role here. So they first, they, of course, they control when we trigger these instabilities. And another function would be here is that you can also uh, uh, push the material to go to a different type of instability, uh, different, 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 uh, different microstructure. So of course, you can change the sizes of these two and play with that and create uh, different patterns out, out of that. So. Um, Okay, should go back to um, to the slides. Uh, <clears throat> so schematically, what uh, that looked like that. So so there are lots of interesting things in between, but that defined deformed state, and then if we measure the uh, Poisson ratio, something that that we can define as a Poisson ratio even in large deformation, so that will uh, look like that. So there is a critical strain uh, when it buckles. And then after that, so we have something close to 0 0.5, not precisely, so that normal behavior of the, of the composite. And then we have a reduction uh, in the effective negative Poisson ratio. And, uh, but of course, it doesn't really happen. The negative, uh, negative Poisson ratio doesn't really happen right after instabilities. And uh, uh, it just, you, need, you need to deform it more, and then you can 
uh, you can tune that with deformation. So in, in fact, uh, this oxidative behavior is not directly related to instability. It's just purely geometric. We'll just uh, uh, made the material to go into that, in the, into that uh, regime. So basically, if you think about it, of course, I can print any or create somehow manufacture material at any of these microstructures already here, and that will, will, will uh, exhibit this behavior. So uh, with not exactly that, because there are some stresses already in the system that may affect the behavior uh, in a way. But uh, mostly, this, this behavior is defined by the geometry, by the microstructure that we have after instability. So, uh, so there is a space for, for another. Uh, 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 result for this structure, but I will use that uh, when we go to connect it to what I called in the second section of talking about um, elastic waves. All right, so another, another system that we looked into is this uh, sort of uh, network uh, symmetric system. Uh, this is a stiffer phase, and we embedded that in soft matrix. So largely, it's based on uh, a lot of things that we already know for honeycomb structures, very old field. And, uh, so the, and of course, you compress this material, uh, and it will buckle. So now what we have here is that we can also play with the uh, contrast between the material stiffnesses. And then uh, remembering what the simple results for laminates, we will, by uh, tuning that, we can change the uh, wavelengths of how it will buckle. So. <clears throat> OK, so that's just a schematic of that. So and then we'll have the different wavelengths. Now, the examples will be like that. So I can uh, start from simple case when I have can accommodate here, design that. Uh, the thickness ratio and the material stiffness ratio, so we have many wavelengths. But I also can design it in a way when I have exactly one wavelength here to accommodate. So and then, then all together, they start uh, creating something more interesting. I can, nothing prevents me to do, uh, to, to choose the material such that I'll have only half in that, so that, that in another pattern. And I actually can, can go even further and can uh, make it in a way that when it buckles, the, uh, we will have the, <coughs> the wavelengths that will be larger than unit cells, so they need to rearrange and more uh, uh, complicated behavior. It's not uh, only one unit cell, but the, there will be more complicated, larger unit cells. So, and then diff different, different, different patterns that uh, uh, will uh, will start to emerge from from uh, this this way. But this fully in controllable way, uh, and similar to laminates, we can uh, have a map of that. So we change the material properties, and so we can tra travel from uh, different configurations from this fixed geometry to to different different uh, different patterns here. Uh, okay, so and this is uh, uh, the again the 2D system, uh, but something uh, quite simple but very interesting. What happens here? And connects to the to the effective analysis uh, for long wave for macroscopic instability. Now this is um, again a 3D printed, a very simple structure, uh, circle inclusions so or rods. In two, well, in 2D we'll still treat them as circle inclusions uh, and soft matrix in between. We're going to compress it. And uh, there, well, there will be some instabilities, right? Something will happen. So you can see that they rearrange somehow. So it's not that they're still in the perfect aligned mode, uh, but maybe not that easy to see. So uh, so if you look closely, and there is a, some uh, cartoon to that, too, uh, you will see that there are some uh, domains or so some sort of twinning patterns that form uh, when you have one one of these domains aligned. Uh, with a few a bunch of these inclusions in one direction, and the, the other one is uh, this anti-symmetric uh, case. So, <clears throat> so we can uh, so it actually happens. Uh, so we can change this behavior with uh, uh, changing the spacing, this simple geometry here, and then still uh, getting this uh, very nice, very nice structure. So the thing is that the instability here is predicted by these. And actually, if you use a block flow here with that effective modular and homogenization, you do predict that and quite accurately when it happens. But what is predicted is that you are supposed to have a, a long wave mode, so the long wave instabilities. Uh, but uh, apparently, uh, what we see here in experiments is that, is that uh, uh, you, you have finite wavelengths of what is typically called a microscopic type of instability. So there's a, a little bit more that we need to do in theory to, uh, to understand uh, better how they are connected. <clears throat> All right, so uh, 
well, there's one measure of, uh, of these, let's call it domains, uh, is that the angle that it forms, of course, it's, it's zero, right? So if it measures the, uh, the before instability and then, and then when the domains start to form, uh, so then uh, they can follow these angles and uh, see um, how the microstructure uh, develops in that. So <clears throat> one of the things here um, that may provide a little bit of uh, sort of understanding of what happens, uh, so this, when we put these inclusions closer to each other, that's where these uh, domains uh, are formed. But here, uh, and we already saw that, it's basically the case when we can consider that as a single layer, right? And just many inclusions close to each other, so it's just a reinforced region versus matrix. And that it should, should uh, work or buckle uh, in similar ways as laminate. And we do the experiments, and of course, we will, that's what we see. So that's very similar to, to laminate behavior. But it doesn't, it doesn't really surprise, right? So now I go here. I bring them a little bit closer. But apparently, uh, these regions are not really close enough to each other so to affect anything that happens. Uh, <clears throat> so the wavelengths comparable to, to, to here probably don't really see any difference. Uh, but here already, they are already close enough uh, to start affecting each other. And so then the wavelengths already changed. Now, if we bring them these columns of, of these inclusions close to each other, so they already, they cannot really uh, form this wavy pattern, and they need to find sort of frustrated, and uh, they need to find a new new way to rearrange that, and uh, <coughs> and so that, that, that that's the transition to that uh, uh, domain or twinning twinning uh, type of uh, instability. All right, so <coughs> um, going to to the, the what I called acoustic metamaterial, so but probably two words that are not really correct to say here, so. They're not really metal materials, and it's not really acoustics. It's elastic waves. <laughs> it's just short enough to put it here and <laughs> to, to still, still hope for some interest for that part. Um, uh, so, so this is the again going to the back to that microstructure. So we get these different modes of structures, and so what? So one one of the things that we tried to do because we know how to do that is to to see how the elastic waves propagate here, and it appears that. And here is comparison of these dispersion curves in the undeformed case and when it buckles, so that uh, we have a frequency range when the waves will not propagate. So there's band gap. We can think, okay, so we can uh, cancel some frequencies, maybe cancel noise or whatever application, if it's realistic at all. But numerically, in theory, that's what happens after instability. You obtain this band gap. So. <clears throat> Uh, so that's, that's that. So, and I promised here also the example for this. Of course, there will be a band gap here. That's, uh, that's so, okay, so uh, this is a frequency. This is a strain. Instability happened. So we start to, to enter this negative uh, Poisson ratio regime. Not yet, but we open the uh, band gap here at the low frequencies. So there are all these band gaps. Like if you go high in frequencies, there will be actually infinite number of them. It's just typically what you're after is it's a reasonable size of the microstructure, sample size. You want to go down and have some uh, low frequency band gap. So, uh, so that's 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 why that may be may be interesting and, and useful. Um, however, so <clears throat> all right. So that's uh, um, so from here I'm going to yes. Sorry, what kind of oscillation? Are you looking at vertical oscillation? Uh, you okay, so um, so here, um, so here, this, this is uh, the path in that uh, uh, brilliant it zone. Or experiment? Huh? Is it numerics or experiment? Whatever comes with elastic waves, no experiments at all, just okay. pure numerics. And uh, so this, basically, there, here I, I'm going through this, uh, uh, the edge of the brilliant zone, and uh, so there. Are any directions, but not all the wavelengths. So I do the numerical analysis for that. Uh, so it's not that I scan the whole, whole way, but it's believed, and uh, also I'm not sure if proved, that then if you have the band gap there, so in, uh, within the brilliant zone, you will not have a, a wave propagating. propagating. So that's, that, that's here. Um, <clears throat> uh, and again, so, yeah, so this, this is numerics. Uh, so any direction of propagation here, uh, but here, of course, I'm showing only, um, so this is already not a dispersion curve. It's already taken this 
the width of the band gap from dispersion curve, and this is for a particular direction of propagation, belief in this direction, but need to check. Uh, and they actually change, so they have different band gaps in, in this and that direction, because it's, it's not really isotropic if you look into that in, in, in this direction. Uh, is your curve saying that uh, the band gap happens at low frequency because of negative Poisson ratio? Or just, that's what you no, no, it's, it's, uh, I, I would actually argue that it's not related at all. Okay. So you, have, you can have uh, material with negative Poisson ratio and no band gap. <laughs> you have a band gap and, I mean, so, okay, so that probably, okay. and, and in fact, it actually happens already here. Uh, there are two factors, and that's what I will try if I still have time to get to what, what really leads to creation of these band gaps and uh, what is the role of geometry and what is the role of the this distribution of deformation and stiffnesses in the material. Um, and so, so the first step was uh, sort of we're trying, going to simplify things in by step by step. That's, okay, so we, that's how, that's basically not for the reason of how it's the best way to present, but that's historically that how it happened, and they are probably stuck uh, with that. So, uh, so step, one step back is just, okay, let's go back and look into laminates. They are very simple, so I can probably uh, uh, get some idea from there. Um, uh, and so this is dispersion curve of the laminate, and I send a wave along the layer, so there are no band gaps there, nothing to stop it. Uh, that will, how it will look like, it will go to infinity here, and just li linear, uh, uh, like that. So undeformed case, so start deforming it, and then close to instability, you have this, uh, the, the, this type of curve here. So, and then, of course, uh, you can uh, immediately calculate and see that there will be a negative group velocity appearing here, so that's, uh, <coughs> uh, so uh, for, for, certain, for certain range of, the, uh, of wave numbers, so there will be uh, so, so in other negative properties that will emerge, not, not, not only negative Poisson ratio, but also negative group velocity. And uh, then uh, for these different wave numbers, uh, you can get the situation when the material is still stable, it doesn't buckle, but the material already feels that there is something strange going on or nearby, and that's where you have this uh, negative group velocity. Uh, I'm not sure if that really illustrates much, but that's a change in the modes of the propagation, propagating in this direction. Um, <clears throat> uh, that's before instability, so not before instability, in the undeformed case. This is also before instability, but very close to that. And then the motion actually here is a local, maybe not the right word, but it's concentrated uh, and going through the, the layer rather than the, in, in the matrix. So this is laminate, uh, so we get this negative group velocity here. And in fact, when we looked into other system, we found this negative group velocity appearing uh, appearing uh, new instability in all these systems that we talked about. It just, yeah. So what does this mean to have a negative group velocity? Uh, what is the physical property? Well, there will be some mode that will actually will, will uh, take the energy in the opposite direction. So that's a... Uh, and uh, so you can also probably say, uh, in, um, uh, so you can get to negative index materials similar to optics in pressure wave, with an acoustic purpose. So we didn't explore that much, but uh, we, so you can create a material that compress it, still will be uh, stable, and then send, uh, send the last, no, no, well, some signal, elastic wave from the material that is undeformed, and then the, the refraction angle will be not what you, uh, usually would have this positive uh, index material. Um, and you're looking for the, uh, not the, the wave number, the complex wave number, but the uh, uh, effective density and the effective compressibility of your system. Do you see if it is, is this negative velocity, growth velocity comes from the uh, a negative uh, bulk modulus or a negative uh, density? Uh, so this system is already, so each phase in here has a positive, posit, yeah. po po positive uh, bulk modulus or yeah. positive, positive modular. So, and in fact, it doesn't really, even in this case, uh, near to instability, doesn't show this exotic behavior or anything. It's just simple laminate. And yeah. uh, they, so, they, so that's what I'm saying. They're not really related, this exotic yeah. behavior with the negative. Yeah. They are both negative and in, in, in one of these systems, but that's probably the only um, connection. So, <clears throat> so, 
So this lambda, so I guess that I will, okay, I will skip this part, so it's just showing that very similar behavior also in 3D with fiber composites, but just with more colorful pictures here. And then simplify this even more uh, to just looking into homogeneous materials first. Uh, and again, so it's just a reminder what we do. So it's small and large, so we first deform material uh, and then use a deform state and use this, this small amplitude uh, wave propagation analysis. Basically, usual potatoes that we have, uh, reference state deformed, and then small perturbations here, that, that's the analysis. But then, uh, <clears throat> so then I can, again, uh, derive very simply the some properties of a typical uh, models that we use, typical, typical potentials, uh, Neaukian, simple one, gent. Uh, and basically the difference is that, that here I can tune, I have two constants, I can with one constant tune the stiffening so it becomes stiffer as I stretch more prominently. Just to illustrate that, not everybody needs that, some know very well these models. But basically, so this is for Neaukian, uh, stretch, stre uh, stre uh, stress, so compression, uh, um, tension, tensile loading, and with this different with gent, with playing with that parameter GM, I can make it stiffer as I, as I stretch. And that basically affects the, the, the wave propagation, right? So if you think about the, uh, the velocity, so if it's stiffer, so that, 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 that you will have a larger velocity. So that's what, what basically will happen. So without deformation, the phase velocity, so of course it's isotropic. But then if I use uh, my, uh, this uh, um, uh, potentials, Neaukian or Gen, so what, what we actually assume by using this potential is as I stretch or compress, I change the velocity of the material. So that's, uh, that may or may not be uh, very, very realistic, but that's actually what we do, and uh, many people do it as well. Uh, so, <laughs> so you change that, so then, uh, so yes, we printed not in a show that, and just to show exactly the, the, the we change the velocity, but you typically would plot it as a slowness. So, and, and then you can also think that if that's the case, so you can create situation when, uh, because there will be mismatch in slowness, if you deform, a material so we can disentangle, we can make the shear wave to travel in different direction, not as a pressure, pressure wave. Uh, and so, it, okay, so I'm not talking here about this dielectric elastomers, but you also can do similar, uh, sim similar, similar, produce similar effect with electric field for that. Not sure entirely why you would need to separate pressure and shear wave, but again, with, theoretically you can do that uh, by deformation or by, by other uh, biased field. Um, <clears throat> So, and so next we, so now we know how the homogeneous phases would, would, uh, would change as we deform. So uh, I'm adding that geometrical effect to that, but uh, I don't want to complicate the system in a way that, uh, so, so I, I choose laminates because like the deform, deformation field in each phase will be constant. So that, so the, the I can, I don't need to worry about the changes locally. So, um, and, I, and in this simple system, you also know how you change the geometry as you, as you deform it, unless you buckle it, right? So, that, uh, well, um, so that, that's a very simple uh, system to look into what is the role of the changes in the material properties, right? Uh, stiffening and the change in the geometrical properties. In this case, it just will be simple thinning or, uh, of, the, of the layers. So, and so then there is an exact solution in large deformation for that. Uh, you can construct based on that exact solution effective potential, uh, acoustic tensor, and then you have these phase velocities here, just uh, you know, some, some mathematical derivation for that. And that would be a long wave estimate uh, for, 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 for velocities. But there are also an exact solution for that, so you don't need all this machinery really, it's just you can, you, can, uh, you can use the very old uh, uh, solution for dispersion curve uh, that would, uh, you know, uh, you, for the case when the waves propagate perpendicular to the laminates, that's actually where these band, band, gaps, uh, band gaps appear. Um, and so you basically have the dispersion relations. Uh, uh, so the frequency and the wave number, and the only thing that we add here is very simple, is that, uh, because of the assumptions of our potential is with the deformation, we change the velocity in each phase effectively, so we can account for that. Uh, so the, the thickness, so here is D, of these layers also change in very simple, key, very sim simply if this incompressible material, that what we can uh, assume, so it's very simple how it changes. And the, uh, basically the density also can change if the compressible material, so we can account for that, it's not really complicated. Basically all of this, uh, components here are 
functions of, of stretch. So we can just uh, look into how these band gaps and dispersion curves will change with stretch. This is the dispersion relationship. These are our band gaps. Uh, so shear waves, pressure waves, um, so it's some, some deformation level. So <clears throat> they can look uh, into how it changes uh, with the volume fraction, material composition. And so there is, you can also create a situation when you have large band gaps, you just need to choose the right composition if you're after that. Um, <clears throat> so, well, putting them together so there will be the intersection areas where there will be complete band gaps and there are no shear or pressure waves. Uh, and uh, that's uh, so undeformed case, deformed 50%. And that what you can notice is that actually the pressure wave changed, it shifted up, uh, but shear waves didn't really, so the band, shear wave band gap didn't, didn't really change. So they stay the same at the same uh, uh, case. So um, I'm going to look into that uh, more closely. So now continuously deform it, so my stretch. This uh, shear wave band gap is pressure, so it goes up, similar to what we saw before. It's in 2D deformation. It says now we can, no stiffening basically. This is gen, so when we have uh, uh, enough stiffening, so you see that shear waves start to change here. But sim very similar behavior also in 3D, so when I, I can do equibiaxial deformation uh, here. So, and again, so it's not only that comes from the way that we constrain deformation in 2D, it can be done also in 3D here. Um, <clears throat> And again, so similar change when I have stiffening, so shear waves start to change. So basically, uh, what happens here to save all the uh, all, all these things? So, um, so there are two factors, right? So there is a geometry and material change, and it appears that this for shear band gaps, that um, for Neokian case, uh, these two effects just cancel each other entirely. It's just sort of coincidence. There's nothing really. It's just the way how we put this energy function. It wasn't designed for that. But that's what happens. So, uh, so in that dispersion relationship, when substitute everything, so stretch just goes away. And you deform the material, nothing, nothing really changes for shear waves. Uh, but of course, you change different potential, and it's, it's entirely up to you if it's not really compared to experiments. So you can take a, uh, any potentials. And, I don't know, Aruda boys gent that produces this stiffening, and then you start obtaining this result. And for pressure, Pressure waves, it's really super, super simple. It's just the geometry that governs everything unless you allow bulk modulus to change with deformation, which is not typically the case for, uh, for soft materials. OK, so that's a, a, a little bit rushed uh, to the summary. So that's a, a, few, a few, again, same examples of uh, the instability modes that uh, we had. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Stefan. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, in the first part of your talk, you discussed strain rate effects uh -huh. in this composite material. And uh, I was wondering what kind of constitutive viscoelastic model you have used. Uh, it was a really very simple one that we uh, adopted and it produced, it was uh, what is called quasi-linear viscoelasticity. Um, so you have uh, the, uh, so you have a Peroni series for, so you, you have an, so you still have large deformation, so you incorporate hyperelasticity and then you have on top of that some uh, relaxation function that knows for, easy, for history so all these exponents that you can integrate and, and, but the problem with that is that just it becomes really very sensitive to what constants you put in, and that's uh, uh, so we tested the material separately, not as a composite in certain regimes, which not may not really be very adequate to what we had. So it's, it was like the experience working with the modeling of this was not really very pleasant. Too many constants; it's really hard to see what we are doing. Change a little bit characteristic times. And uh, you, you start getting uh, but, you, but you could identify the visco this viscoelastic model on the only the matrix. Hmm? Ah, so uh, it appears that the material that we use uh, is that. So the the uh, characteristic time scales uh, for matrix that affect the the behavior are not comparable with the layer. And basically, we're using only viscoelasticity of the layer. 
uh, mostly. So we have also this coexistive matrix, but it doesn't really is not really very strong. And basically what we do is just you can think about, it's not entirely true, it's how I thought about it, but you can think about uh, just the layer becomes stiffer as I load it faster. But if you just use that, it's not what you get really. So it was my idea initially, but appeared to be by far more complicated than that. So there is a history of that. So it's not, yeah, so I think I did it just a really very simple way. So in experiments saw that and in the numerics did this quite uh, simple work. Uh, yes, in all the experiments you are doing, you are 3D printing your systems. Right. Yeah. And so you say there's, you never saw any delamination, even when you load the system quickly or, or even if you cycle you, 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 the system? So, uh, you, so, so you have very, very good bonding. You actually can make it you know, uh, debond. But uh, the chances are that you probably will rupture matrix in some other places. So we, do, we did see sometimes when we get to severe deformations uh, that something ruptures, but not necessarily at the interface. Actually, at interface, uh, so what you have, you have, so it depends on the resolution of what we print. So if you, if you print it with a relatively small resolution point for us, not for people from Nano. <laughs> world, but you basically you go with one layer and you start mixing them and they cure and then so it's not that you have a sharp interface where to debond. So. Uh, some other questions? Okay, I, I just may have one last question. It's like maybe two slides after that where you were talking about micro uh, instability and long wave instabilities just after you, you sh and you show a picture um, is it fibers laminates or ah okay the, the sort of yeah. domains or yeah. uh, just before I think no just uh, uh, no no it's 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 the end of that it was an experimental it, it, this, one. This? no 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 it was no. it was the one you showed before uh, ah sorry uh, sorry sorry let's go back again not fibers this this one this one oh this one how, oh. how do you make I, I understand numerically how you can make the distinction like it's not the same way you. I suppose like uh, the tangent matrix goes to zero, the determinants or thing like that. But experimentally, to me, for example, long uh, wavelengths, you still have a little uh, a, s a wavelength or something. You know how how you distinguish well, between them? So it's just because it goes. No, so basically here, uh, if you will increase the size of the sample, and you will see that it will be the wavelength will be even larger. So it just yeah, it might be that you actually will hit a limit. It will be it will uh, so you, it will be long enough. You will see this finite wavelength. But then now the question whether it's long waves or microscopic waves sort of. No, but I have my answer. It's like so. it's the dependency to the to the size of the sample that you don't have with the microscopic one. Right, right. Microscopic, well, again, here also will be depends. If you make it very small, OK, so you, you crash that, right? So, But here, you will increase it. And most likely, you will not be able in experiment to increase it enough to actually to catch the, 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 the ones that may, may appear there, not, not in infinite uh, wavelengths. OK, thank you again. And, uh... Thank you.